I'm so glad that you're here with us today. And I'm glad, as the psalmist said, glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. But I will admit to you, when I woke up this morning, I was... And my doctor said, I'm not supposed to be having caffeine for a while, so I tell you, it's the pits. <laughs> oh, man. So I've been praying that God would give me the energy I need and keep me awake. And I just ask that you would... Uh, I'm glad that you're here with us and just asking God that he would help all of us to hear from his word this morning. So we've begun, we've just recently begun our study in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Now, uh, our theme, and I, we like to have a, a theme for the year here at the church. You can see right up on the wall, following, winning, leading. Last year, our theme back here on this wall was discipling the nations. Jesus told all the believers, all the disciples to go into the world and teach. Teach every nation. And that word teach is the word disciple or to make disciples. Now, maybe you've heard the word disciple, but maybe you've only heard it as from the 12 disciples. So what is a disciple? What's it mean to make disciples? So making disciples is kind of like teaching. Except there's a difference between discipling and teaching a class. I can stand up in front of a large group like this today and I can teach and that's good. And you'll learn, if you're paying attention, I hope you'll learn lots of good things. But discipleship is a little different. It's still teaching but it's a little more personal and a little more one-on-one. -on -one. Jesus, we know, he had a, quite a few followers, actually, that followed him all over the place. But about halfway through his ministry, he picked out 12, a small group. And those 12, he taught and he trained and he showed them what it meant to be a Christian, what it meant to follow and choose God. And of those 12, he even had smaller groups. He had Peter and Andrew, Peter, James, and John, that he did some specific things just with those. And so discipleship is more than just teaching our class. Discipleship is teaching others one-on-one. -on -one. It might just be me and another having a Bible study, showing others about what, what I've learned in the Bible but it's more than even just a Bible study. Because we could just say having a Bible study. But it's more than that. It's, it's Bible I think is where it starts. But it's life on life. You get to see how I'm living. And I can help to teach and show you through the way that I live. And the way that I act. Not that I'm perfect. Right? Uh, <laughs> my wife's not supposed to be amening that one. <laughs> but she's right I am not perfect I don't pretend to be we're all sinners here saved by grace and God's not done with me thankfully and, I'm, and that's the whole concept of discipleship is I'm finding another that I can help and I can teach and I can show them about Jesus and I can make an impression on them but I have somebody else that I'm learning from because I'm not done. And discipleship, it's not just like a two-week course that we do here. Discipleship, you think about it. When I disciple another, I teach another person, I show another person everything that I know about the Bible and about God and about living for Him. Is that going to be done in a two-week course? No, we're talking about a lifetime kind of thing. Just life on life, living together, learning together, helping each other, teaching each other about God and about Christ. That's what was going on at this church here in Thessalonica. And so that's what our, our theme here is for this year, following, winning, leading. Have each of us to have someone that we're following, that we're learning from, something, someone that we're seeking to show and to show about Jesus and someone we're seeking to teach and to teach them about the things of God. 
<clears throat> so what we see here in this passage and in this book is that example is laid out by the believers at Thessalonica. Now, just like me, I'm not perfect. They weren't either. They had some issues. And later on in this study, we'll get to some of their issues. And some of them were pretty big. But Paul is right now going to be praising them for the way that they are discipling and teaching others. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Our application question today then is this. Who am I seeking to win? Who am I telling about Jesus and about salvation and how they can know Christ as their Savior? And then, who am I leading? Because we can tell others about Christ. And, and for myself, I, at a young age, about four or four and a half, I came to realize that I needed Jesus and that I was a sinner. And I trusted Christ as my Savior. I asked him to save me from my sin, just as a young boy. But when I got saved, I didn't just all of a sudden know everything, did I? I had to learn. And my parents... They taught me. There were Sunday school teachers in my life, my grandparents, and they taught me and they helped me to grow into the person that I am today. And each of us should have a desire to help others as, as they grow and to show others Jesus. So that's our question here today. So let's pray, seek the Lord, and then we will look in our passage. <clears throat> Lord God, I lift you up today. You are great. You are the one and only true God. Lord, we, we look to you this morning and ask that you would guide us in this word. Lord, that your spirit would be moving in each of our hearts and minds and our lives this morning. That you would show us our need for you and show us, convict us of those areas in our lives that we could change. And I ask, Lord, that you would be working in our hearts and minds today. Use me, Lord, I pray. I just ask that this would not be something that's about me, but it's about you, and that you would give me the right words to say. And I ask, Lord, that you would be working in each of our hearts, including my own. In Jesus' name, amen. So, our passage then, if you didn't catch it, is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. We've already looked at verses 1 through 7. Now, the first part of this, we, we looked at the believers there at Thessalonica, and we saw, uh, you know, they didn't exactly have an easy start. Paul came and he preached about how Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins. And many people there, they believed the message and they accepted Jesus and they, they believed him and they repented. They turned from their sin and they trusted Christ. But many, many people did not and they hated the message that, that Paul was teaching. So much, the Bible says here that they, they went and found lewd fellows of a baser sort. That means they went to the drug dens, they went to the gangs and they found the thugs <coughs> And they brought those people to the, the Jason's house. He's a Christian that was someone that believed that Paul and Silas and Timothy were staying with. And they brought those men to drag them before the court. And uh, it was, they, they drove Paul out of town because they didn't want to hear any more what he was saying. But Paul now is writing this letter to these people. And he says, uh, you know, I I've been praying about you. You've been on my mind. We had to leave you. He was there for probably a couple years. Teaching them and training them. And then he got forced away. And so you got to wonder, like the Apostle Paul, I mean, how are they doing? What's going on? Are they, are they following God? Are they even meeting as a church? Are they learning and growing still? What's going on? I would be concerned. And they, there was no Facebook to look at the church's Facebook page and see what's going on. You know, there's no telephone even to get call. You got to send somebody or go yourself. And you, you walked. So 
uh, you know, you could get maybe about 10, 10 to 30 miles in a day, depending on the terrain and how many people you have. And they were about 100 mi- at least 100 miles away when Paul wrote this. But Paul begins by saying, hey, I'm so thankful for you and I'm thankful for your faith and I'm thankful to see what, what God did in you, the work that he did in your hearts and lives when we were there. And then we come to verse 8. And he said, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord. The previous verse he said, so that ye were in samples. That's an example to other people. My life to another life. To all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. That's where we get that word, that impression. My, my, little, my little Pastor Aaron, all right? <clears throat> so he said, you were in samples. You made impression on other people's lives. Not only to those in Macedonia and Achaia, but we're going to see here much further than that. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Sounded out literally means like a loud trumpet. A loud ringing from a trumpet. You just sounded out the word of God. And that's our key, key word, our key phrase here. From you sounded out. 1 Thessalonians 1.7 says, So that ye were in samples, I already read that one, to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Now, I, I meant to get a map up here, and I didn't do that. But just keep in mind with me here. You have the, the area of Israel, and then you have the area of, of Greece going into Rome and Italy and, and Europe. Macedonia isn't just a city. Macedonia is a big region, a big area. Just like we live in Huron, but we live in the, great, in the big area of Beetle County, right? There's a lot of people that maybe don't live in Huron, but they live in Beetle County, out and around the city. And there's a big region, and beyond that we have the state of South Dakota, and so Macedonia and Achaia were, were regions encompassing many cities, not just one or two cities, cities and even smaller villages. And we think in ancient times, well, they were all living in, in huts. And some of them li- traveled in tents, but some of the cities there, archaeologists are finding, uh, they were a lot more advanced than we thought w- we might think. Some of the cities even had some running water in them aqueducts and things like that. 2 <clears throat> Thessalonians 3 1 says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. <clears throat> now, before we go to, to Romans here, It says here, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to Godward is spread abroad. So when you sounded out, you told others all about what God did for you in your life. And if Boy, if you've had a life-changing experience, we should be telling others about it, right? If, God, if I had cancer and God cured the cancer, I should be telling all kinds of people about it. <clears throat> he says, you, you guys, you did. You sounded out the word to Macedonia and Achaia, but not only there, but every place, all over the whole region. Your faith to God word is spread abroad. Now, how was that the case? As I said, they didn't have cars. They traveled by foot. So how is it they got people all over the whole region to hear about the gospel? Some of them might have traveled, but most of them didn't. Most of them stayed there in the city. But the city of Thessalonica wasn't just a little little city thing. It was a big, booming metropolis. A lot of trade 
went there. It was a coastal city, so a lot of ships would come in. And there was business and trade and people from all over the whole region, really the known world, would come to Thessalonica to do business and to buy and sell and various things. And so just from telling others and teaching others about Jesus in their city, they were able to spread and tell the gospel and tell others from all over the whole region about God and about Jesus and how he died for their sins. We're going to... Romans 10, 14 through 18, I was going to go there, but we're just I'm not going to have the time here this morning. But I would recommend you write that down if you're writing notes and uh, take a look at that passage there. That goes into greater detail about going and teaching and uh, going forth to many regions and areas. <clears throat> so they went to Macedonia and Achaia, and every place. Romans 1.8 says, First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now that's a tall, we, we might think that's a tall order. If we know Jesus is our Savior, and we've trusted him, then our job is to tell others, and not just we start with those nearby us. The Bible says in Jerusalem and in Judea and to the uttermost parts of the earth. You start with where you live right there and then you work your way out. And if I'm teaching others and I'm training and I'm telling others about Christ and I'm taking that time to invest in a life and they're investing in other people and they're teaching others and they're investing in others... That's how this kind of thing spreads. Now today, I actually, our church's Facebook page, there's people from other parts of the world that are subscribed to our Facebook page and that are watching and, and reading and watching our sermons. But with the internet, that's easy today. But back in Paul's day, that wasn't. It was done by word of mouth. And it spread throughout the whole known world at that time. I came across this quote. We are not intended to be the termini. That means the, the ending point of our blessings. The blessings that God has given to us. Salvation through faith in Christ. It's not just that God, he saved us and okay, great, that's the end of it. No, we're to be channels through which these blessings can flow to others to tell others the good news. God shines in our hearts so that the light might shine out to others. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The Bible talks a lot about light and dark. Light is righteousness and holiness and darkness is the absence of that, which is sin and wickedness. And there's a lot of wickedness and suffering and horribleness in this world. But God has sent Jesus to be the light in this world and died on the cross for our sins. And each of us are meant to shine the light of the gospel and shine the light of God, of hope and of peace and of purpose and of mercy and of salvation. If we have really drunk the water of salvation, the Bible, Jesus said, I am living water. He told the lady at the well, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for water and you would never thirst again. He was talking about spiritually if we have really drunk the water of salvation, then rivers of living water will flow forth to those around us. John 7, 37 through 38 says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Paul says 
that you sounded out the word of the Lord to Macedonia and Achaia, to every place, and it's spread abroad. It's all over the place. Not just one or two people here or there, but all over. Everybody has heard of you. Now, not, maybe not everyone has believed in the message of salvation and in the gospel, but everyone at least knows about you and about your faith. And we'll see that in a moment. If we look now at verse 9, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to Godward from idols to serve the living and true God. And at the end of verse 8, it said everything was spread abroad. It says, so that we need not to speak anything. So here's what's going on. The Apostle Paul and his, his little group there, they went to Thessalonica and they preached the gospel. They taught them, they discipled them. And then they were forced away and so they left. And they started traveling all over the area in Macedonia. And they'd come to a church, a city, and they'd start to preach the gospel. And they'd tell others about Jesus and how they can be saved. And some would get saved. And then they'd start a church there. And then the church would grow and they would teach and disciple that church. And that takes time. Years in in many cases. And then Paul and his group, they'd go to the next city and they'd start preaching the gospel. But they'd start talking about the gospel and they would find people that go, Oh, I know about that gospel. Those people, when I was, when I was in Thessalonica, I, I ran across some people and they told me all about that. And they showed me everything. And <laughs> Paul said, it's getting to the point where everywhere we go, we don't even have to tell people about the gospel. They already know. And it's because of you. It's because of you believers in Thessalonica. That can be true even of us in this church in Huron. If we're teaching and we're showing and discipling others. And he says in verse 9, For they themselves show, that's our second key word there, show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turn to God from idols. <laughs> so Paul says, these people that we're talking to, not only do they know the gospel, they know that Jesus died for them, but they know us. They already know about Paul and Silas and Timothy, and they know what kind of people we are, because you've told them about who we were and what we did and how we lived and how we showed you. He says that you show that they they're telling us what manner of men we are, the way that we live our lives, and they heard it from you. That's incredible. For they themselves of us show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. First Thessalonians 1 5 through 6 says For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. See, that's the the beauty of discipling and making an impression on another's life. It's not just teaching and preaching, but it's the way that Paul and Silas and Timothy, they lived their lives. And how they interacted with people. And someone does wrongs them and hurts them. And rather than lashing out and returning evil for evil. They chose God's way and they they forgave. And they gave forgiveness. Rather than acting in hate they acted in love. And so many other ways that God commands us and shows us. And if we trust Christ as our savior. And we turn from our wickedness and from our way we repent. And turn from our sin and we turn to God. I'm telling you it changes your life. Even myself at four and a half years old. My life was changed. What do you have to change at four, four years old? I remember at four years old growing up in a Christian home. I had friends around the neighborhood. I remember swearing and cussing when my parents didn't hear me. I remember... 
<laughs> I, I was an older brother. I, I gave my brother a pretty good, pretty hard time. But especially when I was younger, I, I just, I remember some specific things. And God changed me. Even as a little boy, changed me and changed my heart. And now I wanted to tell everybody about what, what he did for me. And I was telling everybody I came across. God can change our lives. This, this world, I'm not going to lie to you and say, oh, it's all puppies and roses and kittens and rainbows and good stuff. And you trust Jesus and your life is going to be great. And it's going to be so easy. No, this life is hard and it's tough and it's full of suffering. It is. That's sin. There's sin in the world and there's wickedness and wicked people and wicked things. Corrupt uh, leaders of the world. I'm not saying that trusting in God will make our lives, makes your life easier. But God gives us a purpose and a meaning. God can give us eternal life that we can live and dwell eternally with him. There's a joy that comes from that. There's a power. And I don't know what, what you all are dealing with your lives. And maybe there's suffering. And maybe there's, you're, you're under the power of, of an addiction. Or there's, there's a, a problem going on in your life. God wants, wants to and can help. I'm not saying that God accepting Christ is like, you know, coming and rubbing on a lamp and asking the genie for help. God doesn't say, I'm going to take away your problems. Jesus said, come unto me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. That means you come and you give me your burdens and I'm going to help you carry them. And I'll take the weight from you. But I'll go with you. I'm not going to take, it, I'm not going to take the burden away. It's going to be suffering. But I'm going to carry the brunt of the load. <clears throat> Jesus said, my burden is easy and my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So continuing in this verse, Paul says, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. These believers in Thessalonica, they suffered. They were persecuted. Some of them even gave up their lives, died for what they believed in. Well, it says when, whenever we went around, he says that the people are showing us what manner we had among you, what kind of people we were. But then they're showing us how you turned to God, or excuse me, let me read it here. Turned to God from idols. So they, when Paul met them, they were worshiping idols. And I've never really understood how you could do that. You... Uh, you carve out of wood this little statue and then you bow down and worship it like it's your God. And you've made this thing and it's become an idol to you and you worship that. Well, they turned from that worshiping that idol. Now, the truth is, though, anything that I worship, anything that I seek after and I follow and I put first in my life can be an idol to me. It might be money, it might be my career, it might be power, it might be, I, I don't know, each of us has our own thing that we deal with and struggle with. And many people like to say, well, you know, uh, atheists, the, those that do not believe in God, like to say, well, you know, uh, p people have their religion, but I don't need a crutch, I don't need something to worship, I just, I just do my own thing. And then they talk about Mother Earth and Mother Nature and how Mother Nature is mad at us. Well, that's, that's a force. That's an idol that's being worshipped. Each of us has idols and things that we're worshipping, basically meaning that I've chosen to follow whatever way that I want and not God's way. Now, God doesn't force us to choose him. Each of us has a choice. We have free will. But we each need to know and understand that we need him. And it's our choice whether or not we're going to follow him. 
And that's exactly what these believers did in Thessalonica. They turned from their idols and they came to God. And they trusted him and he changed their lives. How, how do you think that people were knowing all about these believers? Because these were probably rough individuals that their lives just radically changed. And people saw a difference in them when they turned from their idols to serve the living and true God. And then they turned, verse 10, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. They even, these people that they're talking to, even know some of the things that Paul taught them. That Jesus is going to come back one day. And they're waiting for him to come back. And they're serving him and living for him in the meantime. And Jesus is the way that we can have salvation and be delivered from the judgment of sin. Now, there was a few verses I was going to go to here, but we're just about out of time. So we're going to have to skip through some of those and come to the end here. Our application question then is this. Who am I seeking to win and who am I leading? And I might add in there. Have I ever trusted Christ as my savior? Each of us ask ourselves that question. If no, consider the things that you have heard here today. Think about it. Read, read the word. Uh, if you have questions, oh, I would love to answer your questions. I, I'd love to answer any questions that anyone has. If you do know Christ as your Savior, are you telling other people about it? Are you seeking to win and show others about the hope that is in you? Who am I seeking to win? Who am I leading? Who am I teaching and showing others? Am I making an impression on someone else's life? Also, as we talked about with the brown sugar this morning, am I soft like that brown sugar and allowing God to make an impression in me and to change me and to shape me in the way that he would have for me? Let's pray here this morning. Lord, I just, I do thank you for who you are and the power of the gospel and the power in your word. And I ask, Lord, that you would use that to impact each of us here this morning and that we would be changed, changed into your image. None of us are perfect, including myself. And we need you, Lord, and we need your help in all areas and manners of our life. I ask that you would be working in us today, helping us to be see, seeing our need for you, helping us to be showing others and helping others to come to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.